This week on Motor Week, we bring you our Christmas special, and in a celebration of the new millennium, we look back at the cars that have shaped the century and at the best of what is yet to come. It's the Golf GTI, the original hot hatch. For me, it deserves to be one of the cars of the century. After all, how many other cars can claim to have created their very own sector, leaving the rest of the market way behind, struggling to keep up? Back in the 70s, Volkswagen squeezed a tuned 1.6-litre engine into that family favourite, the Golf. They added sport suspension, alloy wheels and created the GTI legend. It won the heart of anyone who drove it, providing all the thrills without the financial spills of a supercar. Back into the 90s and we're on to the fourth generation Golf GTI and how it's grown up. It's no longer a sizzling hot hatch aimed at the younger market. Instead, it's a well-built, high-class model that will gently warm you up. And because this top spec 1.8 litre turbo costs 17 grand, it's mainly going to be well heeled 30 somethings who can afford to drive them these days. Now, over the years, the GTI may have lost some of its bite, but in terms of quality, it's a class act. Everything about this car is extremely well designed and very, very well built. In this top of the range model, you get luxury leather Recaro seats, the obligatory air conditioning, electric everything, and one of the best satellite navigation systems I've ever used. Plus, there's enough room for four adults to travel in comfort. Golf GTI has always been about is the driving experience and the 90s version doesn't disappoint you. Okay, it isn't quite as tight and responsive as it used to be back in the 70s, but it still handles absolutely terrifically. Everything about it feels very, very slick and the engine responds incredibly well, letting you get all that power down without giving you any nasty surprises. And all that is complemented by a superb gearbox that feels extremely slick and is very direct. With 150 brake horsepower pumping through the engine, 0 to 60 comes up in 8.5 seconds, and the top speed is around 134 miles per hour. But if you are on the market, do make sure that you go for the turbo version. The 125 brake GTI would struggle to pull the top off a rice pudding. Like the drivers who fell in love with it back in the 70s, the Golf GTI has certainly grown up. And whilst it's still in fairly good shape, it's just getting a little bit flabby around the middle. But while we're being middle-aged, let me remind you that its quality and reliability are second to none. And although it may not make you smile quite so much as it did a few decades ago, the Golf GTI certainly deserves a place in the heart of any motoring fan. So, how do you choose a favourite car of the century? Well, it's a tough one, but for me, it has to be a sports car, and the car that has stood the test of time is the Porsche 911. In fact, the 911 has just celebrated its 35th birthday, and there's not too many cars that can lay claim to that. Even today, with the newest 911, the 996, you get that classic look and staggering performance. 1964 saw the introduction of the first 911 with a 130 brake horsepower 2 litre flat 6 engine. Gradually over the years it's evolved with different models and features like a targa roof and convertible. Today in a 911 you get at least 300 brake horsepower. But it's out on the road while the 911 really comes alive. You can stand there all day drooling over it but driving it opens up a whole new world. Many people don't like the 911. The engine's in the wrong place, they say. It's too much of a handful. It's true, you have to be careful in some conditions. But find a stretch of empty road and get that engine behind you singing. The 911 has never been a perfect car. It has its foibles, like the offset pedals, cramped cabin and heavy clutch and gear shift. But even an old model still remains valuable and has that ability to turn heads. Porsche have tried to kill off the 911 when they first introduced the 928, but that's fallen by the way, and the latest 911 has become so refined, but still with that astonishing pace and the chance to put a big smile on the face of any driver. From the moment you turn the key in a classic 911 and that famous boxer engine fires up into life, burbling away behind you. The 911 was one of the few cars to have an air-cooled engine rather than water-cooled. 
and that stayed with the car right through to the last 993 model in 1996. But then with the launch of the 996, water cooling had to come. Refinement was the key for Porsche. So the 911 remains for me one of the cars of the century, offering both fun and frights, sometimes in equal measure. The classic shape, special models like the 959, a car to treasure, a car that will hold its value. So that's my car of the century, the Porsche 911. Go on, Mr. Hammond, see if you can beat that. Ian Royal tried to persuade us that the Porsche 911 was the car of the century. Well, I don't see how any show about the car of the century could be complete without at least some input from Marinello. So I've chosen this, the Dino. And if its puppy dog cute looks fail to move your heart, and I don't see how they could, then its story will certainly win you over. It's named after the great Enzo's son. Dino is short for Alfredo, and it could be argued that this, the baby Ferrari, had the biggest influence on one of the world's most famous sports car marks. Note the position, it's mid-engined, and this, when it was first launched at the end of the 60s, was the first car from Ferrari to have its power plant mounted amidships. In fact, with a very few exceptions, it wouldn't be until the end of the 90s and the 550 Maranello that any Ferrari driver would sit with the engine in front. Unless, of course, things went very badly wrong. It's beautiful, isn't it? Now that is a proper car interior. The Baby Dina was a contemporary of the big Ferrari Daytona, and on this particular model, this is a Daytona interior with the striped seats. It's exactly the same as in the bigger car, but an awful lot smaller. It was designed in here by Pininfarina, as was the exterior, and I reckon this inside is every bit as beautiful as the outside shape of the car. The original intention was that the Dino, badged Dino and not Ferrari, would begin a whole new range of more affordable sports cars from Maranello. In fact, when the car arrived, it was such a revelation, people adored it and it in itself inspired a whole new range of mid-engine Ferrari supercars. Note that prancing horse Ferrari badges seen on surviving examples today are later additions. In fact, originally, due to its fairly minuscule 2.5 litre V6 as opposed to a V12 engine, Ferrari were not at all happy about having a prancing horse on it at all. Despite being nicknamed the Baby Ferrari, the Dino was at the time hardly a cheap car. It cost about £8,000 when a Daytona was admittedly twice that at £16,000. But you could buy a V12 Jaguar E-Type for just £4,000. It may not be the fastest, and it's certainly not the biggest, but the little tiny Dino can claim to have inspired several generations of exotic and flamboyant supercars ever since. Now, Ken Gibson wants to try and persuade us that the car of the century should be even smaller Richard, on behalf of the great British public, I accept your challenge. Forget all about that Italian nonsense. I'm backing Britain, and I give you the Mini. When it came to choosing my car of the century, not a problem. I only had one choice. It was instant. It was the Mini. To me, it's the perfect motoring icon. There's two things I really loved about the Mini. The first one is, it's one of those rare cars that really is classless and ageless. It appealed to just about everybody, from royalty and the rich and famous, the Beatles, Rolling Stones, David Bowie were just a few of the celebrity owners, to ordinary people, just like you and me. The second thing, of course, was its sheer simplicity of the car and the fact that it was just great to drive. And here are some rather fascinating facts about the Mini. Did you know that Sir Alex Izagonis, the creator of the Mini's brief, was to create the smallest car possible to take four adults and their luggage, and at an affordable price. With a car at just 10 foot long, and costing under 500 pounds back in 1959, I would say succeeded pr pretty well. Did you know as well that this little car was the inspiration for Mary Quant's creation of the mini skirt, which brought almost as much enjoyment for certain people as the actual car did. Did you know that this incredible little car went on to become a film star? Who'll ever forget the Italian job? 
And the Mini also became the first car to get its name as an entry into the Oxford English Dictionary. And did you know that the Mini didn't actually start life as the Mini? The British Motor Company was so concerned that it was that radical it might put people off that they decided to call it the Austin Super 7 and the Morris Mini Minor, just so that people would get used to it. And did you know that Sir Alex Isagonis not only created this little masterpiece, but he also had another classic British car to his name, the Morris Minor. And all those incredible little facts are why I believe it's going to be an awful long time before anyone comes up with anything that's going to beat the magical little Mini. Still to come after the break, we look to the future and have a guess at what is yet to come. Shh! In the 21st century, proper cars aren't allowed. I've seen the commuter sector bite the dust. Saloon cars are long gone and don't even mention estates. But one type of car has survived the prying eyes of the authorities. Sports cars. This is the Lotus Elise, and she's still around because of one very important factor, fun. Back to the 20th century for just a little while longer, and the Lotus Elise is definitely one car that offers plenty of driving thrills. And there's this obsession for using alternative types of fuel and, of course, the dreaded public transport continues. I don't think it will be too long before we have a sensible but very dull car that gets us from A to B. And we own something like a Lotus Elise as a little plaything for the weekend. After all, Lotus make cars that really have just one aim, that they're fantastic to drive and, of course, fantastic to look at. Even the petrol cap is just beautifully designed. Oh yes, I'd be more than happy to have the Elise adorning my driveway and even happier to take it out for a weekend spin. There's just one problem, getting in. Because the Elise is so low to the ground, you have to kind of step down into it. And that means that there's absolutely no ladylike way of doing it. And if you think that was bad, then you should see me getting out. And on the inside, well, as I've already said, Lotus aren't too bothered about gizmos or gadgets. What you get is very comfortable sports seats, lots of exposed metal, and that's about it. If you're the kind of person that wants the wipers to turn themselves on for you, and you're rather partial to a few cup holders, then this isn't the car for you. This is the car for you, however, if you enjoy driving. It simply oozes pleasure with every one of the 143 brake horsepower that you'll get from the 1.8 litre engine that's been borrowed from Rover. 0 to 60 takes five and a half seconds and the top speed is 133 miles per hour. But perhaps the most impressive figure is the 14.4 seconds that it takes to reach 100, a figure that could put some supercars to shame. And remember, all of this is in a car that's not too distant in relation to a go-kart. If it's power-to-weight ratio you're after, then you can't do better than the Elise. On the road, the Elise simply begs to be pushed. Now, it doesn't feel incredibly quick, but it does feel very eager. You have the most fun in the mid-range, flicking up and down this slick little gearbox, and it's very at home on some lively country roads. The handling really feels second to none. Steering is very tight, very direct. Just a flick of the wrist sends you where you want to go. And because you're so low to the ground, you feel incredibly involved in the drive. Just remember, though, that the Elise is, just as it should be, rear-wheel drive. But it has a tendency to get rather twitchy in the wet. The Elise is such fantastic fun to drive that it's bound to be around long into the new millennium. You see, when we're all driving to work in tin cans that run on potato fuel, we're going to need something to have a little bit of fun in at the weekend. But now it's over to Ian for some technical stuff. 
and I'm sorry, Ian. I'm sure it's going to be very useful in the future, but I'm afraid that I'd rather have a clay. Looking forward, what do we envisage happening with cars? Well, I think that small cars which are cleverly designed will be a very important part of motoring in the next century. The costs of running a car are, of course, rising all the time, and it's not going to stop. So cars which are relatively cheap to buy in the first place are attractive. We'll look for innovative designs capable of carrying a family and all its luggage, but which merely sips fuel along the way. Personally, I like designs of vehicles such as the Mercedes A-Class, despite its early problems. A competitor for the A-Class will be the Audi A2, due out in summer 2000. What makes the A2 different is that it's the first volume production car in the world with a body made entirely from aluminium. The weight savings are substantial compared to steel-bodied cars, with the A2 weighing in over 40% lighter than if it had been made from steel. Low weight should mean real savings on fuel too, and the car will feel agile on the road. Service intervals of 2 years or 20,000 miles have an effect not only on your bank balance, but on the environment too. So, with a revolutionary car like the A2, is safety compromised? Well, it certainly shouldn't be. The Audi space frame is made from high-strength aluminium profiles, which acts like a protective cage around the occupants. The high-pressure aluminium castings used at the front posts are of a complexity that surpasses any element used in the aircraft construction sector. The entire section from roof post to the luggage compartment edge is made from a single extruded aluminium section. Audi predict that fuel economy on the A2 will be impressive, offering some 60 miles to the gallon. The A2 will also be launched as a variant capable of covering 100 kilometers using just 3 litres of fuel, which for a car of its size is truly remarkable. So why haven't more car makers gone down the same route as Audi in producing aluminium cars? Well, it's difficult to say, because if the A2 is a success, and it surely will be, perhaps others will decide that this form of vehicle is viable. There's no doubt that development costs for both the original aluminium car, the A8, and the new A2 have been substantial, and perhaps is why other manufacturers have been put off. Also in the next century, expect to see the cars laden with gadgets becoming more standard. At the moment, it's really just the high-end luxury sector which gets TV screens, navigation and adaptive cruise control as part of the range. But we think that mainstream car manufacturers like Ford, Vauxhall and Rover, to name just a few, will start offering these items as extras and then eventually fit them as standard. In-car entertainment and electronic wizardry will be a boom area in the coming years. Coming next on MotorWeek, Richard Hammond wants to introduce you to an innovative city car already available. All those technological advances are very clever, but I've seen the future, and it's here. Sorry, it's here. It's a funny thing, but as people are generation by generation getting bigger, Cars are getting smaller, and this is very small indeed. It's the Smart, and it's the result of a collaboration between Mercedes, the car people, and Swatch, the watch people, obviously. Just because it's small, though, don't let that fool you into thinking it's basic, because it isn't. They've managed to pack an awful lot into it. For a start, all of these plastic panels covering the exterior are interchangeable and removable, which not only is good news should you ding one in the busy city traffic, but also means you can change the colour of your city car as and when you like. Okay, it may only seat two, but it actually does so in quite a lot of comfort. And how often do you really need to take more than two people in a car anyway? Once you're inside, it's not only the size of it that's quite surprising, it's the luxurious touches. We've even got air conditioning in here. But I do get the distinct feeling that somebody or something somewhere is looking at me. That'll be the rev counter and the clock then. It's funny, everything's kind of perky and chirpy in here, which makes it quite a pleasant place to be, and having a glass roof helps as well. There's loads of light. 
There are a few oddities too, like I haven't done this since I was in an old Saab. I do not like small cars. I can't stand them. So this thing must bear the full brunt of my hatred. You get that? I hate you. I, stop looking at me like that. You can't, can you? You can't hate it. I try. Now, it has a turbo, which you might not expect. But what you definitely won't expect is that the gearbox is switchable between three-speed automatic and a six-speed manually operated sequential. The only problem is every time you change gear with it, it pitches the car forwards, so much so that it feels as if it's about to execute a perfect forward roll, which would be alarming. Mind you, it doesn't actually use fuel at all, never, ever. Well, maybe the odd sip. Certainly expect at least 60 miles to the gallon. Another handy feature, if you find yourself bored sitting in another endless city traffic jam, there's great entertainment to be had from the windscreen wipers. Just waiting to see if they clash. They will one day. Ooh, ooh, nearly. Yeah, oh, oh, nearly. Yeah, oh, no. Yeah, oh, yeah, oh, nearly. Yeah. It's a hobby, you know. Oh, no. Yeah. As visions of the future go, it's hardly Blade Runner, but if our cities are to become ever more congested, then small cars are the only way to go if we're going to hang on to our own personal cars at all. The smart may not be perfect, quite a long way from it in fact, but it does point the way. Coming up on next week's show, we take a look at those cars that are always crowd pullers at the motor shows, the concept cars. All that next week on Motor Week.